Noswet Dara Kreuzer. Good evening and thanks for tuning in. This is our first panel event for Stand for Nature, a Wales-wide initiative to empower 9 to 24-year-olds to take action for climate and nature. I'm going to be introducing a very special panel of people to you tonight. But first, let's show you what Stand for Nature Wales is all about. Momentum is growing. Gallwch chi fod rhan o'r adeb, mae'r amser wedi dod i sefyll dros ein planed. Wildlife is disappearing. Seas are warming. Wetlands are drying up. But yet, there's still hope. We can make a difference to our natural world. We can make change if we stand together. Join us and stand for nature. Wow. That's a powerful video. It gives me goosebumps every time I watch it. Stand for Nature is such a necessary and timely piece of work for the Wildlife Trust in Wales. And I'm very excited by the team at Radnorshire Wildlife Trust and the connections they are building with young conservationists. So, tonight we're going to be hearing short presentations from four inspiring leaders within their field before opening up the virtual room for a panel discussion on making your voice heard in conservation be that through establishing a career or by finding other ways to influence change. Our first panelist is Madison bowden Parry. Maddie has an undergraduate degree in Marine and Natural History Photography and a postgraduate MSc in Evolutionary and Behavioural Ecology. Maddie has worked alongside BBC and National Geographic photographers, and I'm sure many of you will have seen her high quality output online and on social media. Maddie also works on the ground as a community based conservationist and is also a published academic author. So good evening and welcome Maddie and um, I believe you're going to give us a short presentation so over to you. Oh wonderful thanks so much it's uh, really lovely to be here tonight um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, before I introduce myself and, and go into my talk, a, a lovely introduction. Thank you, James. Um, but I'd also just like to thank the, the whole team at Radnisha Wildlife Trust for having me on this evening. Um, I've actually been a part of Stanford Nature Wales uh, before, uh, so it's really nice to come back and, sm and play a small part and contribute to the project tonight to share my own story and hopefully uh, help others who are, who are watching today. So on that note, my name is Madison. On paper, I'm a behavioural ecologist, a marine and natural history photographer. I'm also the comms and fundraising officer at the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales. So I'm part of the, the larger Wildlife Trust movement as well. But I'm also a freelance science communicator, consultant, presenter. I wear many hats and, and I've had some really fantastic opportunities to work within practical conservation, research, science communications, expeditions and wildlife storytelling. But most importantly, and hopefully you'll pick up throughout my talk tonight, is that first and foremost, I am a naturalist and I'm a conservationist and an activist who's working hard to champion positive change for the natural world, sort of through all of those interests that I have and all those hats that I'm wearing as well. So the reason I've said this sort of over my qualifications and throughout my own career, because even now, um, it's been really, really important to me to recognise and stay in tune with this why. So stripping back all my qualifications to really get to the foundations of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing and how that transcribes into a professional career and also personal development as well. So 
for my talk this evening, I'll be sharing my literal journey um, into conservation, perhaps uh, not everything, because we might be here all evening, and I've only got 10 minutes to discuss it, but I'll discuss some of the poignant moments throughout my career, um, what I did to get there, some uh, opportunities that I had, and most definitely the hurdles that I came across. So my journey into conservation isn't traditional whatsoever, and I believe it's really important to be transparent about that, to ensure complete accessibility in this field because there's certainly not one route to your dream or your chosen career. So I wanted to show you this picture here um, where I was freshly 18 on my first university trip in Iceland. Um, I had just finished college. I studied photography, film, media and graphics. So I did no biosciences whatsoever at college. And I wanted to show you this is because in this moment, in this picture, I was thinking of all the things that I enjoyed in my life on a personal and a recreational level. But I was thinking, oh, gosh, I just don't know what I'm going to do career wise. I had no sense of direction for a professional career. And I just want to say that that's really OK. You don't you don't have to at this point in your life. And my journey into becoming a conservation professional all started from moments like this where I just really didn't know what I was doing, but I knew what I enjoyed, I knew what I was interested in, and I knew I wanted to contribute to the field of conservation. But at this point, I just didn't know how I was gonna do that. And I certainly didn't have everything, everything figured out. So, like I said before, I went to university, I knew my passions, knew my interests. I had a real natural curiosity for the natural world and enthusiasm for, for conservation as a sector. And I really wanted to dedicate my life to it, but at this time, I just at a very young 18 years old, I just didn't really know how to do that. So university for me was about finding my feet, pushing myself out of my comfort zone and developing uh, skills and interests, because that's sort of all this information on the screen here is sort of what the information I had to go off at that point. So at the start of my talk, I mentioned about understanding and, and finding and tuning into your why, because I really do believe it's helpful in building a career in conservation. It's definitely helped me. So even though your interests and our goals will change over time, they're very plastic. So just like minded from going from the arts to academia, which we'll discuss in a moment, my passions and my reasons for doing what I was doing always aided in my development. And they will, for you, be an asset as well throughout your career. So all of the things I've got listed down here are sort of elements of what I enjoyed, of what aspects of what I knew about myself, my interests. And what I'm going to show you today is how all of these sort of translated into building a career in conservation for myself. But even with all of this, I still hadn't prioritised going to university. I really wasn't sure if there was a professional degree out there that would fulfil all of my passions because I just didn't really know where to look or who to ask at this point. And if it wasn't for me stepping out of my comfort zone and just sort of going for it, I wouldn't have had that moment that I just that picture in Iceland where I was freshly 18. I wouldn't have had that moment where I recognised for the first time how my values and my interests in life would translate into a career in conservation. So I spent many hours looking uh, for ways in which I could progress these passions and my, my values and my interests and turn them into opportunities for myself. So I went on to study an undergraduate course at Falmouth University, uh, Marine and Natural History Photography, and that sort of ticked every box for me. It had elements of adventure, arts, exploration, social sciences, but at its foundation, it was an arts degree. And that's something that sort of isn't discussed um, openly as much in conservation as the role of arts in conservation as well. So. Of course, university isn't the only option um, to, to get into conservation, nor is choosing a Bachelor of Science and then progressing up the higher education ladder. But following your interests is just so important to get you to where you want to go. And for me, this course really did open up a lot of opportunities and allowed me to not, learn, not only learn about the natural world, animal behaviour, wildlife, conservation, storytelling, camera operating, producing, directors, so many things but fulfill lots of personal interests for me as well, like scuba diving and expedition leading. And through this degree, I was able to actually go over to Baja in California and work with some amazing professionals and document the most vulnerable shark species in the world, which is the blue shark um, on the bottom right-hand corner there. So I joined a crew 
over in Baja, California. I was alongside uh, Kyle McBurney and Joe Platko, who are BBC Blue Planet contributors and Nat Geo photographers, as well as Amos. You might know that image in the top right of the leopard seal and the Gentoo penguin. It's a particularly uh, poignant image and, and very famous. And Amos is an expedition leader for Apple, Microsoft, Discovery Channel, Disney, Nat Geo. The list really does go on for Amos. He's a really established photographer and expedition leader. So over the three seasons, I worked alongside these um, fantastic people and professionals. I built skills for myself and built a network of connections and support network. And then I returned for another two seasons as well, just to work there after university was finished. And I wanted to point out here that along the way in your career, there will be so many opportunities that arise to you that perhaps you might not be interested in at first, or they seem daunting or pot potentially not directly linked to where you want to go or you vision yourself in the future. But even so, I would suggest and encourage for you to do those things and to take those opportunities, because even if the shoe feels quite big at this point um, and you feel out of your comfort zone, very much like I did, you know, sort of stepping into this world and this industry of of big filmmakers, um, you will be doing a lot of growing and a lot of learning at that point. And even if it doesn't feel like it at the time, you'll be learning so many skills that are transferable and will be an asset to you later on in your careers as well. So, and for me, you know, developing those skills and trying new things, trying on those shoes that, that, that were way too big, I was uh, I was particularly interested in, in doing that, really. Um, I've always been a very curious person, and I knew I wanted to expand my own field of view, and that's where I jumped over from the arts to academia. So even though I had a background in arts, um, I was accepted onto a Master of Science at the University of Exeter, because of all those transferable skills that I had learned along the way. So during my master's, I attended as many classes as possible, extracurricular classes. And so much so um, after my master's, I was able to land a quite prestigious position as a research assistant in Western Australia with Dr. Stephanie King in affiliation with the University of Bristol. And I was also able to publish my first, first, first author paper from my master's dissertation, that's a mouthful. I studied uh, otters as well. So that's online now in an open access journal. And then after this, I was really looking for ways I could diversify my skill set even further and add loads more tools to my toolbox. Um, but I really wanted to bring storytelling and communication skills, which I really enjoyed, something I started off with, uh, with my university degree. I really wanted to bring that to the forefront of what I did. So this led me on to volunteering for my local wildlife trust and then into community-based conservation work after that, working alongside communities and community engagement to help build resilience for wildlife, wild spaces and the people in the local area as well. So that sort of brings me full circle to what I'm doing now which is my science communication work for the Wildlife Trusts of South and West Wales. And it's something that I've been developing throughout my career as I started off in storytelling um, in the arts and it sort of evolved from there. But I truly do believe that for us to achieve nature's recovery and climate justice, that nature must be accessible, which means the conservation field as a whole must be accessible to all. So we, we really need to be doing everything in our power to make sure that we can reach diverse audiences and deliver information in a digestible way that's accessible. So alongside everything else, I really wanted to progress this skill. Um, and that's something that I'm still doing. So this work has really allowed me to reach various audiences and have some really great opportunities to work alongside various media outlets and platforms and ultimately give a, a voice to wildlife and our, and our precious wild spaces as well. So I've come on to my last slide and I, I appreciate it's a very uh, short overview of my career so far. And I wanted to keep the hurdles to the end because I wanted to talk about how I was able to overcome them rather than all the, the barriers that I face. So these are sort of the four main points that I still use and, and I still look back on is um, I work to revalue my own skills. So I took the time to develop the skills I already had and to appreciate them so that I could offer them confidently and be able to transfer them to other tasks and other jobs and other roles that I enjoyed. I also sought advice and information on the diversity of roles within conservation, because as someone who has come from a non-traditional background, it was even more apparent to me that there must be different ways to contribute to the conservation field and make a real and meaningful difference and impact as well. 
I also focused on other ways that I could gain experience of adding those tools to my toolbox. So I gathered practical skills, volunteered, worked as research assistant. You know, I developed my map and my, and my code, my coding skills. Now I was wearing so many different hats and I still do, um, but they sort of make me who I am as a conservationist today as well. And they're unique to me. And finally, I bridged the gap in my own passions by developing my communication skills. And just like I, I mentioned, I saw a gap not only in my own interests, but in the whole field of conservation at this time. So that sort of tied everything together for me. And I was able to communicate all the, the knowledge and the information that I'd learned along the way to hopefully inspire others to take action for the natural world as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate that was a very quick overview of my career so far, but I do welcome questions. Um, or if we don't have time, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. I'd be more than happy um, to connect with you and uh, answer any other questions. So thank you all for listening and I'll hand back to James. All right, thanks, Maddie. That's great stuff. And you know, you certainly had a very interesting start to your career <laughs> so far. So yeah, you've sort of touched on this a little bit, but um, if you could give people some, some top tips for building their own skills, and the skills needed for a career in conservation, what would they be? That's a really great question. And I could sort of talk about that all day. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my first one would be to not be afraid to diversify your skill set. Um, because I guess with my own professional development, you know, I've got many hats and I still wear many hats. And I think it's okay to wear those hats. Um, and the skills that you will learn will be transferable to so many other things, you know, whether or not you want to volunteer, undertake courses, you know, train the way you want to, maybe university, industry, apprenticeship, diversifying your skills and your skill set and adding more tools to the toolbox, as I, as I was discussing, will ultimate, ultimately make it so much easier for you to innovate, create communicate, adapt, and of course, increase your confidence as well. So my other tip would be to never ask and uh, never be afraid to ask questions. You can never be too annoying. And I really love this one because my master supervisor, she told me this and I've really stuck to it and I still stick to it. You know, there'll be so many opportunities out there and so many people and networks to make, but how are you supposed to meet them or how are you supposed to find out about them if you just don't, if you don't ask? You know, you just have to ask questions and stay curious and don't be afraid to do that. Another one would be to progress communication skills. So obviously that's something that I um, actively work within as a conservation professional. But even if you don't want to go into science communications, I think it's really, really good and handy to have communication skills. Because if you want to work as a, a nature reserve officer or a ranger, you'll have to talk to landowners, volunteers and the public. If you want to go into academia or research, you know, you'll need to be able to communicate your work. So tips for helping develop those common skills. There's so many resources online now um, that are given by nonprofits and community groups. So I would advise everyone, encourage everyone to, if they want to develop that skill, to look on uh, the digital world because there are so many things to find out that are free, but you can also do um, graduate and postgraduate courses in science communications now. You can do apprenticeships, you can do free online training sessions but if you don't fancy doing a training session look out for volunteer community groups youth groups in your local area that are focused on on conservation campaigns and topics because you can learn a whole heap of skills through volunteering as well and then i should probably start wrapping up i guess but <laughs> um my last one would be to believe in yourself and your skills because rejections will happen and what's really great about us conservation folk is we are doing what we do for the love of the natural world. And we're naturally driven uh, to, to elements of this field because we're really passionate about what we do. So I would advise everyone to use that drive, that dedication, that enthusiasm to really explore different skills, develop them and be confident in them because you will get rejected and rejection will happen, but that's where we learn and that's where we grow. I've certainly been rejected uh, throughout my career a lot of times. So if you work hard to build those skills and be confident in them and believe in them, those rejections will become much less personal. And they're not personal anyway, um, but it, obviously it feels like it at a time, but they will be much less personal to be able to overcome them a lot quicker and try not to compare yourself to others as well. Focus on your own path, take your time. It's not a race. Things will develop in time as well. Yeah, very wise words, Maddie. 
particularly in like what you said about um, communications as well, because you know it's almost a bit of a cliche, isn't it? But people only care about what they know, and ultimately, in conservation, we're trying to change people's values and behaviours. So we've got to get mm -hmm. the message out there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I did have a question for you before I go. Okay. Um, <laughs> what tips would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career in leadership? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great question. And I think, you know, we've got to start by defining leadership because, you know, to me, it's something you can do at every level. You know, you're a leader. Everyone here tonight is a leader. You know, anybody, you know, no matter how big or, or small or how senior or, or minor their role is, can, can undertake leadership. Mm -hmm. but I think your presentation touches on some some really good stuff in terms of, you know, how to, to build yourself up because, you know, to be a leader, you've got to build resilience. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, you've got to seek trainer. You've got to take advice on leadership and ultimately you've got to practice it because you've got to yeah. find your voice. And you've got yeah. to work out how leadership differs from management. And, you know, it's not all about like standing at the front and making brilliant speeches or always being right. You know, you, you can chat to my team and they'll definitely validate that I'm not always right. <laughs> and, you know, but if you do want to get into, you know, what people would see as a conventional leadership role, you know, and it'd be that, you know, in an organisation or, or just managing a team, you need to be aware that you can't do it on your own. You know, you've got to listen yeah. to people, you know, you've got to support people and you've got to look to build a team that is yeah. balanced and, you know and and covers your weaknesses and the organization's weaknesses yeah and then i think like, yeah definitely yeah and then you know like you've said you'd, you'd need focus and determination you know, yeah. you've got to do the work you know yeah competitive um sector you've got to have a goal but yeah. try not to make it too fixed because there's only yes. you know, one ceo in each organization i think you've the got important to have thing, sort of flexibility and and plastic, you know, every goes goals will change, things will change along the way, and it's how you sort of adapt to those, isn't it? That's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you yeah, have that, have that goal, have set that direction of travel, and yeah, then go for it. Yeah, awesome. Thank yeah. you. That's cool. Well, thanks, Maddie. So I no think problem. it's um, time to introduce our second um, panelist for tonight. So let's move on to to Ben Porter. So Ben grew up on Barsi and describes himself as an h and Hi Ben, how you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to, yeah, it's been brilliant so far. Fascinating talk from Maddie, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's good stuff, good stuff. Right, so, yeah, are you ready for yours? Yeah, absolutely, shall I, shall I dive on in? Wow, yeah, Let, let's, let's give you a full intro. So, you know, Ben Porter, since graduating with a degree in conservation biology from Exeter Uni, Ben has spent his time working on projects ranging from rewarding and sustainable land management in Wales, to seabird research work on offshore islands. Ben also undertakes wildlife survey and, and research, activism, and can still be found volunteering on local projects. And if that's not enough, Ben is also a freelance photographer and guide, and is particularly passionate about science communication, engaging others with the natural world. And I'm all for that. So Ben, over to you. Fantastic, thanks James. Hopefully you can see that all right. Great. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing a few of the other panelists as well later. That was a really great talk um, from Mali just now. And I think with conservation, I think it's just it's it's fantastic how many different directions people can come into this field from and um, with my own sort of journey i'm going to give a bit of an insight into sort of where i'm at now and sort of like how i've come to be where i am and um hopefully you know you'll find some useful tips and um advice from this but um yeah i'll uh, delve on in so briefly just touching on a little bit of, of of sort of what i do um and what my passions are really um so yeah, as James said, sort of first and foremost, a bit of a, a, a sort of self-described nature nerd. Really, I just absolutely love many different elements within the natural world. Everything from bird life through to insects and moths, the tiny little things, and the bigger, grander sort of things like like birds as well. And uh, I currently do sort of freelance ecology work and wildlife photography. 
but have a, a bit of a, a boot in the sort of like land management sector, the sort of practical hands-on conservation, but also very passionate in communication and engaging people with the natural world, similar to Maddie in that sense, the importance of that cannot be understated, especially given the time that we're in right now. And seabirds and islands are one of my real passions, which I'm currently pursuing to try and set up a PhD studying storm petrels in the Northern Isles around the Faroes, north of the UK. So delving into this little talk, um, I'll try and keep it to 10 minutes. It's quite tricky condensing it into this, but um, it's a great opportunity for throwing in some really embarrassing pictures as well here. Um, so my journey in conservation, um, this began for me quite a, quite a long time ago now. Um, I was brought up in, in North Wales, um, where this little white circle is here, somewhere called Conway in the foothills of Snowdonia. And we were living in quite a rural setting here. Um, and my parents had a little wildflower meadow that we were restoring. And I remember the first, my first memory of sort of like engaging with wildlife and becoming interested is watching the birds at our feeders near the kitchen window. And I started making little notes of like what the species were that we were getting and trying to identify them and record what we were getting alongside things like the insects and things that we were finding in the fields. I think I was about five or six at the time. And notebooks, I have stacks of notebooks in my attic back at home of all the things I've recorded over the years. And this is something I'll come back to later, something that's really helped me along my journey actually something as simple as a notebook but for learning about the natural world and making notes of the things that we sort of like study and find along the way I, I think notebooks are an absolutely brilliant tool for the naturalist so and when I was 11 we moved to um, a little island offshore in North Wales called Bardsey Island. Some of you may have heard of this, um, some of you may not. And essentially is its Welsh name, where this little circle is here. It's just off the tip of the Thin Peninsula there, jutting out into the Irish Sea. And this island is a really special place. And we'd always visited as a family. You can stay in some of the houses on the island for sort of a week or two weeks as a bit of a, just a place to stay for a holiday. And we'd visited ever since I was really young and we'd spent time there and really got to know the people there and the land and the island itself. Um, myself and my sister, we absolutely loved the place and my parents really loved it as well. And then in 2007, the opportunity came up to basically move to the island to run the island farm. And my family uh, had no experience doing farming at all, but we absolutely loved the place and we knew the community and that for the people that were employing us was more important than knowledge of how we farm was actually getting along with the people on the island and so in 2007 we upstate and moved to this little island offshore so unessentially is a really important place um, within the Welsh context of sort of like habitats and species that it contains. It's got a lot packed into a very small area. It's only two kilometers long by about a kilometer wide, but it has some really important habitats scattered across the island. It has so many different designations. It's a national nature reserve. It's a special, it's a site of special scientific interest, a special area of conservation, you name it. It's got the designation for it. Some of the species that you can find here that are of a particular important to things like the red bill chuff, the Manx shearwater which nests there with about 25,000 pairs of birds nesting there. So it's this really important site for its wildlife. Um, these are some images that I've taken on the island itself. You can see the sort of diversity is both from a really flourishing marine environment that surrounds the island but also both migratory and breeding birds that live there as well as the insect communities that are supported by a real diverse mix of habitats. So we moved to the island to run the island farm um, and we were living in this house at the top right there. You can see our little sheep dog with the sheep there. We were managing the island with about 400 sheep and 40 cows and we had sort of goats and dogs and ducks and all sort of things that we actually sort of like existed subsistence level sort of on the island growing our own veg and relying on solar and wind power to power our house. So it was a real sort of off grid living, a real contrast to life on the mainland. But our primary objective there as a family was running a sort of conservation farming setup. And from this early age, it was amazing to get the experience and interest in how you manage the land and how you can sort of change grazing to benefit certain landscapes. And so from an early age, getting the experience of that 
um, has really gone on to inspire me in terms of land management in the jobs and things that I've been pursuing since then because it's such an important tool and um, is yeah it's something that's really amazing to be able to sort of have the experience with as well you can see our two little dogs in the little rowing boat although I used to go out rowing with our little border terriers there <laughs> um, yeah. Just quickly, there seems to be a problem with your slides coming through. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you know, you... carry on. It's great, great going. So carry on, just um, talking you... us through it. Yeah, sure. Can you see this slide here? Okay. No. Oh, no. uh, really? Okay. Um, that's weird. Uh, let me just. I'll just double check the uh, the screen sharing. Uh, let me just double check that. Sorry about that. It's really strange. Uh, but can you see that all right? No, I think just carry oh, on. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah you should. Sure. That's come through. Well done. Well okay, done. brilliant. Yeah, no worries. So, homeschooling was something on the island. So, obviously, on the island, there's only 15 people that live there through the summers and through the winter. It was just the four of us living on the island. So it's it's not a huge community. And as you're probably not surprised, there wasn't a school there. And so my parents took on the challenge of homeschooling myself and my sister whilst we were there. So when we moved there, I was about 11 years old. And so we were homeschooled through G GCSEs and A-levels on the island. And this actually, I really enjoyed the homeschooling element we had quite a flexible time schedule where we'd have about four or five hours of school during the day and the rest of the time we'd have free time to both help out on the farm and also be engaged in some of the things that were going on there so one of the the really important um things for my own developing interest in the natural world i mean being surrounded by all the wildlife on bardi island was so inspiring i already had an interest in nature and just being surrounded by that and being able to get out and spend time observing nature, studying it, phot photographing it, um, was so nourishing for my interest and curiosity in the natural world. But something that really helped developing my interest was the Bardi Bird and Field Observatory. So I don't know if anyone has come across bird observatories before, but they're basically a network of almost sort of like field study centres scattered across the UK and worldwide as well. It's about 19 scattered around the UK and they're really engaged in sort of wildlife monitoring, things like bird ringing, which is where you put little rings on birds' legs that have individually recognisable numbers. And then when they're caught somewhere else, you can find out sort of how, how old they are, where they've travelled, all sorts of in, in, important information about those birds. They're also really engaged in youth engagement and mentoring, which is something I'll touch on in a minute as well. So having a bird observatory just, um, just up the road from where I was living um, meant that I spent a lot of time um, doing bird ringing and moth trapping and studying the various habitats and species on the island. So the people that were running the bird observatory sort of took me under their wing essentially and taught me how to do the bird ringing. They gave me a moth trap and I started doing moth trapping in my garden and it was like, whoa, moths are incredible and have been going on to do that and been fascinated in moths ever since. So these these things where they sort of showed me and gave me the flexibility and the sort of freedom to you know get involved and help out with this thing was absolutely amazing opportunity. And it's something that they are able to cater for all across the, the network of bird observatories around the UK. And I'd really encourage people actually to look at the opportunities that are given for volunteering there and spending time there and being able to learn these different sort of field study techniques that are so important for sort of practical hands-on sort of conservation and research. Now, one of the other things that was um, really, um, really important during my time on Bards was my development in my interest in sort of photography and communication. So I spent all my spare time away from schooling and helping out on the farm, out and about around the island doing photography and just getting to know the island in such a small little area. You know, you've got so many different species and things, but it because it is such a small area, you have your little patch essentially and you, you get to know it really, really well. You know, where the light comes out at certain times, which species hang out in different places. And that means you can really get sort of unique and different insights into the behaviors um, of species and get those sort of more eye-catching shots than, um, than you might otherwise do. And this is something that I really recommend to anyone getting into photography is to find a place 
that can be your patch that you really get to know so well that you can get these these images um, of species that you know they don't have to be obviously on bars you've got some really interesting stuff but you know no matter where you are I'm sure you can find somewhere you can get to know really well and get these sort of like really um, yeah really great images um, and it also developed my sort of like curiosity and observation and understanding the natural world so from my time on um, on Bardsley Island, um, just a few of the sort of takeaways from these. So Bird Observatory for me was a really important site of sort of like mentoring and enabling me to develop various skills in the sort of research field. Um, and mentors are something that I think are really important in the natural world and sort of like conservation scene because there's so many people that have so much experience, particularly within sort of like um, sort of like like the sort of naturalist sphere, so things like moth trapping and things, there's so many experts in their field and they're often, you know, really um, up for just sort of taking you under a wing and just showing you the ropes with things. And it's something that I really value for my time on Bardsley and synth. And they're really, yeah, really fantastic and really uh, inspiring people that I've come across along the way. And volunteering and gaining experience with different sort of conservation charities and things like the Bird Observatory is something that um, is definitely really important for this sort of journey along conservation, as I'm sure other people will also say. And since having this experience to volunteer with the Bird Observatory on Bards, I've also um, taken that on with various different organisations when I moved on from Bards itself. Now, being on Bardsley, obviously, it's quite an isolated place. Um, and in terms of young people, there weren't too many others there. And so for me, sort of like connecting with others online was really important and finding that sort of community of other like minded people. So at that point, it was something called Next Generation Birders, birders who were scattered across the UK. It was like other like minded people of my age that were interested in the same stuff and being able to connect there with them and share experiences was really nurturing at that time when I was growing up there. And I also, from you know living on Bardsey, have caught the island bug and absolutely love islands and know that many other people, once they've spent a bit of time on islands, um, whether it be somewhere like Bardsey or like Skoma in South Wales, they are very special places um, and really, really have, um, yeah, caught my attention for sort of my, the future research that I am engaged in now. Now, following, um, following my time on Bardsey and um, sort of developing this curiosity in the natural world and interest in that, I was wondering, you know, sort of like what to do next, really. Um, and drawing on the sort of advice from a lecturer at Bangor University, he suggested trying a conservation degree down in Penryn, the Penryn campus down in Cornwall. And so I went on to study conservation biology at the University of Exeter, right where Maddie was. And that's where I met Maddie actually down in that region. And um, absolutely loved studying this course down there at the University of Exeter, meeting other like-minded people, opening minds to sort of different career options and different skills that you learn there on the course, but also outside of the course. So many opportunities with sort of societies and volunteering op um, opportunities outside of the course. And the sort of support and advice that is on hand from people who both may be researchers, those active um, in the conservation sphere, and people that can give advice about careers as well. It's a, such a, a brilliant um, time that I really, really enjoyed. Now, since university, similar to Maddie, I've got my boots in many different camps, really, and sort of like um, my interest in the natural world is something that sort of drives my passion for these different areas. But habitat restoration projects, something that I've been involved with a lot here in Wales and really want to look into um, elsewhere as well. Seabird research work um, is something that I'm currently engaged in. So I first studied Manx waters and Bardsey whilst I was still living there, putting GPS trackers on the birds to find out where they were going. And that is something that I think is really important for finding out how the marine environment is being subject to the various um, impacts that are affecting it right now. And that's something I'm pursuing right now, applying for a sort of PhD to look into seabirds in the Faroe Islands. Um, and just um, a variety of sort of the other things that I've been engaged with. I'm currently with uh, sort of freelance ecology and photography work for various organizations around Wales, trying to both study wildlife, but also engaging people through sort of communications. Um, and volunteering is something that has continued post university and post sort of like growing up on Bardsey, um, even when I've had jobs and been engaged in that sort of thing. 
um, trying to volunteer with different organizations to gain different experience and appreciation for some of the other opportunities that are out there has been really important. So just a few sort of like thoughts and advice that have sort of come up along along the way for me as well. Um, with the natural world, just following your sort of curiosity and passions as they emerge is something that I know Maddie touched on just now as well, but something that's really helped me along the way is like wondering, you know, where on earth to go, just like finding something you think, you know, you're slightly interested in and then just following that route and see where it goes, you know, and if actually you don't end up enjoying it, it's fine, You'd have, you will have learned things along the way and then you can try other opportunities. You know, you have time, take your time and, you know, you will learn along the way. As I said, like volunteering and finding local groups and mentors that can help you in your journey and learning about the natural world and what opportunities are out there. You know, there's so many different organizations. The Wildlife Trust is a brilliant one for starters, but there are so many others as well. Things like the bird observatories are really worth looking into as well to get experience with the sort of things that I was mentioning back there. Don't be afraid of making mistakes and trying new things. I mean, obviously everyone makes mistakes, but like when I was growing up on bars, you know, things, just little things like the identification of birds, you know, you, you always make mistakes and that is how you learn, you know, don't be afraid of making mistakes and trying new things because it's inevitable, similar with things like rejections for jobs and things like that, you know, it's all part of the sort of learning process really. And something Maddie touched on as well, you know, sort of believing in yourself and not undervaluing your abilities. It's very easy to get imposter syndrome in the sort of conservation field as it is elsewhere, but really sort of valuing, you know, your sort of experience and just trying to not, you know, compare yourself to others as well, you know, just believing in yourself and your abilities. And passion and enthusiasm can go a long way. You know, obviously, you know, getting a university degree and things, you know, does, definitely helps your route along sort of conservation but you don't have to you know getting engaged in working and sort of like volunteering for organizations and just following your passion and having enthusiasm for what you do can go and get you a long way um and yeah finally um if you have an idea go for it this this is something that um for me has been really yeah just fantastic along the way is just like coming up with an idea working with others to sort of like bring that about and sort of see where that takes you um, within the sort of conservation sphere. So yeah, sorry, I don't know if that was uh, pretty run over time there a little bit, but thanks for listening. And uh, hopefully uh, some of those slides came through. Well done, Ben, that was great. You know, the enthusiasm and the passion is just coming through the screen there. Um, and you know, it's great we got to see your photos. Okay, can yeah. I just ask you a quick question? What's your favorite yeah, sure. bird, bird in moment on Bardsey? Um, I think, for me, um, you know, you get loads of rarities and scarcities on Bardsey, but for me, when you have like a real storm come through in the autumn and, you know, the seas are just absolutely massive and you're just staring out to sea and the seabirds just absolutely, you know, flying by, you know, in these incredible extreme conditions and you're just seeing gannets and Manx shearwaters and just seeing that passage of migration so they're moving through, but then also just the, the sheer ability of them to, ex you know, exist in these sort of environments. It gives you such respect for those species, um, but also just, you know, just seeing it and ex experiencing it like that is, yeah, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely, yeah, I'm with you on that one. You know, storm petrels, you know, they, how do they live such lives on the high sea when they're so small and dainty I and mean, it's, it's it's cool really cool absolutely right so uh, one, one, one quick question one yeah um so as a self-declared nature nerd you know how do you feel about engaging with someone who holds the view that nature's not for me yeah that's a brilliant question um i think it's it depends on yeah i think the interesting thing is that I think no one can really say nature is not for me. I would, I would engage them by saying like, you know, where does your food come from? Or like, where have your clothes come from? You know, you're breathing, you're breathing air right now. You know, where do you think that air has come from? I think, you know, we're really suffering right now from a, you know, a huge disconnect from the natural world and from the environment. Um, and I think understanding our place within that and our connection to the natural world is absolutely key if we are to navigate out of the current situation that we're in and to really restore the the natural world and yeah reconnect with the planet and i think um you know engaging some of that like that first and foremost i would go for a walk with them somewhere and like i would challenge their statement straight off i would show them 
any moth that I can find and see what they say about that. But yeah, I would just try and stress that, you know, find the common ground in terms of like, you know, you know, yeah, where does your fuse come from? And then try and start to explain actually how we are so dependent on the environment and the natural world. And I think a lot of people, you know, it comes down to education, to be honest, a bit like you were saying before about, you know, it's not such a cliche quote, but about, you know, you know, you don't protect what you don't know, you know, they need, you know, people need to experience and know about the na you know, nature around them. And, you know, I think there's something like 80 or 90% of people in the UK live in urban areas. So, you know, straight away, it's like, shoot, you know, we really need to work on engaging people with nature, even in these spaces or bringing green spaces into urban areas to engage them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great answer. And I mean, I think, yeah, like you say, it comes back to communication, doesn't it? And the power of telling stories and, you know, you just yeah. got to get people out there, haven't we? We need as many yeah. people, you know, championing nature and sharing amazing experiences like you've had and like Maddie's had, you know, it's good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And may I ask, may I ask you a question, James? Yeah, go on then. Well, on. So, did you did you always want to work in conservation yourself? Um, no, if I'm honest, no. But partly though, because I didn't know it existed as a career really, and mm. until I went to university, you know, like we've heard tonight, you know, I was interested in nature and the outdoors when I was a kid, you know, and but I wasn't an active birder when I was young. That sort of came when I got into the sector, I suppose, really, and started volunteering. Um, did have some id books and you know was encouraged by family and you know did quite a bit of fishing when i was young which seems mm. like a whole lifetime ago but you know mm. spent time on farm ponds and on wild rivers like the team so you nice. get to see life um build up an understanding of of what's going on and sadly in some instances what was already starting to de decline mm. sort of two things happened when i was at uni you know i went to malta in my third year on a, a field study trip um doing physical geography down at, at Plymouth Uni and you know, we we saw the mass shooting of songbirds that goes on mm. there just utterly heartbreaking and we met staff that you know from BirdLife International that are fighting to stop it and I was really inspired by them really inspired by the work mm. that they were doing and then on a separate field trip to the Avalon marshes in in Somerset we met staff from RSPB and Natural England and you know, there, there was like a head warden from Natural England who turned up in a Hilux truck, you know, chainsaws in the back, you know, doors, you know, bins around his neck. But he was talking very eloquently about the technical side of, of conservation and he had mm. a certain passion, you know, for applying that science that we were learning about. And he was making a, a really good point about, you know, chatting to, to Dutch scientists and how much they differed from English scientists. And he stopped because mm. his Chet is warbler singing in, you know, that's <laughs> It's quite a long time ago, like 20 odd years ago, when they quite only he identified it, and I thought, oh, God, that's cool. I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. And then and then after uni, I started volunteering and it took me about half an hour to think, yeah, this is it, definitely for me. Mm. And I've basically never looked back. Fantastic. That's really cool. It's as yeah, it's just great hearing, you know, different people's stories of how they got into it because it's there's so many different routes into conservation. It's it's one of the amazing things about the field, I think, as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So cool, right? Thanks, Ben. That's great stuff. So I think we're on to our next panelist now. So I'll see you in a bit. Right. So our next panelist is Jawad Kershai and they're a marine biology graduate currently taking the environmental sector by storm as a researcher at the BBC Natural History Unit. They're a freelance journalist, filmmaker, activist, speaker, engagement officer for the youth-led nature organisation for Focus on Nature and more. They're absurdly passionate about wildlife, conservation and the environment and speak about these topics in depth while also loving being out in nature, especially on the coast, combing for marine life. They're passionate about and have spoken and written about topics such as diversity politi um, and political agenda for magazines, blogs and science festivals around the country. Dawood, welcome. How are you doing? Hi, yeah. I'm doing really well, thank you. Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating to hear um, the talks of Maddie and Ben. Um, yeah, it's just been really inspiring actually just to hear their journeys and hear about the wildlife they're talking about and the all the all the things they do you know i always go to 
things like this and I talk about the things that I do and I'm always like oh yeah I do many things but they they definitely do a lot of things yeah yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to hear about because it's exciting to know that when you're in this field of conservation that's you know that's what's there for you to get and you know that's that's that could be your future so it's really exciting to hear that I think and um yeah I think that energy attracts energy as well doesn't it and it sweeps people up and it takes people along the way most definitely yeah and I think you know that's what I enjoy about science communication and, and wildlife um in general really is the fact that when you talk about your passion for wildlife and conservation it really sweeps people along and it takes people to a different place in their lives and it makes them see that this is an absolutely you know this is a world that we need to really save together whatever background you come from or whatever future you want to go to because it is you know it's fascinating and it's interesting and it's euphoric really um and you know i'd, I'd say for myself um when i'm kind of talking about where i come from and i won't try i'll try not to ramble too much because i <laughs> have a habit okay. of doing that and I'm, I'm here for quite a short time um but you know, for me, when I'm talking about where I come from in nature, um, where I where I come from in terms of how I got into this industry, you mentioned, you know, different jobs that I do, like journalism and like um, my recent role as um, a researcher at BBC Natural History Unit. For me, what's core to what I do is storytelling. You know, I think storytelling throughout the years of humanity and definitely now is probably the most powerful tool we've got in terms of communication because it it reels people in, it gets them interested in the topic, and then they can really, you know, they can use their own narrative and their own, ex own perspectives and their own experience to explain that story themselves. So for me, storytelling is just core to everything that I do. And I, I try to, whenever I'm writing an article or whenever I'm giving a talk at a science festival or whenever, you know, I'm doing a pitch or putting together something for the BBC Natural History Unit as a researcher and trying to get information on shows that we are that we are doing, I I try to put that aspect into everything I do. And for me, that ties intrinsically with the natural world, you know, with conservation. Actually, um, I picked up on one of the things that Ben said about being uh, homeschooled, because I was actually also homeschooled um, from, yeah, basically birth to uh, year nine. Um, and for me, that's you know, I, I I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everyone because it's hard. It's a hard job for parents to do that. And my mom took care of our homeschooling. She's amazing. But um, for me, that's what got me interested in wildlife was being able to spend time with nature and wildlife in a sort of strange way, because I grew up in a very urban area. You know, I grew up out of a shop in like London and there was no garden, no nature reserves nearby. So actually quite different from Ben, but also quite similar in that, it, you know, we got to focus our time on that. And most of my childhood was basically bugs and insects that came out of the walls, you know, plants that grew outside of bricks and stones, all the tiny little bits and pieces that make up the, for me, the base of the natural world. And lots, lots and lots of David Attenborough documentaries, you know, the, <laughs> we had shelves upon shelves of, um, wildlife documentaries which fueled that passion to go out into the wider natural world whereas the smaller sort of British nature na natural world that we you know were um, absolutely enthralled by came from just everywhere around the house and so you know that's what got me interested in wildlife and nature and I think what I picked up on in this panel is that you can do that you know you can come from anywhere you can want to go anywhere you have flexibility and options in the natural world and like maddie picked up upon accessibility that's key that should be key to us educating other people and getting other people into nature and getting them interested in the natural world and um one of the things that another of the things actually that i focus on with the work that i do in terms of speaking and doing journalism is diversity you know diversity and inclusion i think are things that have actually been um, neglected, especially in the industries around British wildlife and UK wildlife, which is actually the second least diverse industry in the UK after farming. And it shouldn't be like that. You know, we, we come from places, all of us, where we actually, if we think about it, we love wildlife, we enjoy nature and we want to protect it. So why not open it up to fresh minds and perspectives? Because that's how we're going to change um, the planet. And, you know, I think that's just intrinsic to everything that we do. Yeah, I think, you know, absolutely spot on, Dale, very well said, and, you know, hats off to you. I think 
nature is is everywhere really and for everyone isn't it and i think you know we've got to get that message out there you know it's you can be as involved or as you want or you can just take it on face value and you know i learned bird song by sort of lying in bed in in the mornings and just mm -hmm. idea in the common garden species i could hear outside and just going through and you know building from there so that's yeah great. yeah definitely i mean just like picking up on that that's you know one of the things i do as a kid when we finally got a garden was i'd stay i'd stay out super super late because the next door neighbor they had a badger set in their garden and every night if you stayed out long enough you could um hear the mother coming out with her pups out of the set cool. and if you squinted hard enough because yeah. they didn't have anything to see them with you could just see them moving around and in the morning um after i've been told to go to bed like 300 times i'd go outside um and i'd trail like across the garden and you could find all their poo you could find all their snuffle holes you know you could find everything and it was just absolutely it was just beautiful to me and you know and another thing which i um will say as well, even though I'm probably talking too much, is that at night um, in my room, uh, I'd turn on the light and I'd open the window and the walls would be covered in moths. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things I think that has absolutely kept me with moths and kept me with bugs and insects, which is one of the main sort of animals that I'm kind of drawn to, which is some of the work I do as, uh, as ambassador for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust is based on that love of pollinators, insects and creepy crawlies. But, you know, and I'd like to get people interested in that. Just like Ben said, you know, you show someone a moth, you show someone a bumblebee, you show someone an insect up close and they're immediately like, this is not at all what I expected of this animal. Cool. That's really great. So I guess I was going to ask you the question, you know, in your role as an influencer, how do you plan to drive widespread change in society? And you have you have started to touch on that. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, I've, I've only recently been um, told about this term influencer, actually. And um, every time it comes up, I'm like, am I, am I influencing people? I hope I'm influencing them to do the right thing. But um, yeah, I think for me, the main thing that I want to see um, sort of as, as an influencer, I guess, and as someone who shows people wildlife and shows people actions in wildlife and shows people how to do things in various places. And what I want them to learn from that is the fact that anyone can do this. And, you know, for me as a young kid, I never thought I'd be able to be in a place in my life where I'd be able to talk about wildlife, where I'd be able to influence anyone to do anything in wildlife where I'd be able to actually use my passion for conservation and nature and storytelling and film and writing and put them all together and actually make a career out of this. You know, it never ever came to me that I would be able to do this. And that was primarily because I saw, a, you know, I saw or what I didn't see in fact was representation. And, you know, one of the main things, one of the main reasons I do what I do is so that I can represent a certain part of humanity, but I can also represent the fact that anyone in humanity can do this. And so I would hope that, you know, if I see any change in the future and if I influence any change in the future, it is to make it more accessible, more open. And it is also to allow people to understand that, you know, even if you, whatever you do, you know, I've met, I've met journalists who don't specifically write about um, wildlife. And then I've met journalists who don't specifically write about science. And I've met journalists who write about you know, sports, and I met journalists who write about technology, but you can link all of these things into the natural world and, um, you know, and society, because I think climate justice and social justice link together as well. And the fact is, everything's linked. So, you know, I hope that it becomes more accessible and we understand that everything is actually linked and we can all do something to help the environment. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think you're very inspiring. And I think, you know, come and get involved in the Wildlife Trust and help us on our journey to involve more people and a wider spread of people. Because, you know, just today at the um, Wildlife Trust AGM, we've been talking about that. And um, you know, it's very topical. And, you know, we need to do it. You know, nature is everywhere for everyone, but it's having a tough time, isn't it? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we need to bring it back. We need to put it in restoration and, yeah. and tackle climate change. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's absolutely what we need to do. You know, the fact is the fact of the matter of the matter is, like um, Ben was saying before, we've become a bit disassociated from nature, unfortunately. And I think that is more to do with, you know, the fact that how we are taught about it. You know, education is a massive, massive thing, especially when you're talking about climate, environment and nature. 
education you know we're teaching we're teaching young kids about nature in the wrong way i think we're teaching young kids about climate and and about themselves i think because once you really look to yourself and you really look to how you've grown up and how you've understood the world you kind of understand where your thoughts on various things have come from and so by understanding what we can do to link these into love of nature and love of the climate and love of the environment i think you know that's absolutely necessary and um, I, you know, I love the Wildlife Trust, I love the RSPB, I love these organizations that are working towards this goal. And I, I've, you know, uh, when I was young, I always wanted to write and work with the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB. And I find myself doing it now and it's, it's kind of crazy. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. That's good. That's good. I, I, I do have one question for you, unless you wanted yeah. to say something before that. No, no, you go for it. Ask me that question. I will. Um, so, I guess, um, as a relatively young CEO, do you feel that you're in a strong position to influence change within this sector and your own sector? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say the potential is there, you know, in the same way that it is for all of us, you know, you and everyone here tonight. But if I'm honest, at the moment, it takes all my energy and focus to lead Ravnish Wildlife Trust. You know, I'm, I'm nine months into this role. I'm having a great time. You know, there's a, we've got a brilliant team. And, you know, I hope I'm influencing them. And I'm certainly sure that over the next few years, we're going to do some some great things together. I think, you know, influencing the whole sector, that's big, isn't it? You know, I think you, you yeah. look at probably being, you know, CEO of National Trust, RSPB, you know, or in the position that Craig Bennett's in, you know, getting out there and, and really championing the cause and getting lots of coverage. But... I think probably where I can make a difference outside of helping individual or individuals, you know, in their career is, is within the wildlife trust because we're a federated structure and, you know, as a small trust, we, we need to work together with the, the central team and neighbouring trusts. And, you know, at the moment, you know, we're the first UK trust to um, undertake the purchase of land in this instance, a site called Pentuin, which is a, was a livestock farm using a loan system from private philanthropists. And we're also working on, you know, a cross country multi-county project called Wilder Marches. Mm -hmm. So I hope in, in that small way I can help lead the way, but yeah, pa perhaps the sector in influencing sectoral change comes later in my career. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, that, that's brilliant, Dawood, and, and thanks very much. And um, I'll um, see you when we get back together for the panel discussion, but I think we need to go over to, to Michael now and introduce Michael Rogers. So Michael Rogers is a 25 year old conservationist from Newport in South Wales. He works as a part-time ecologist and wildlife photographer, specializing in bats, reptiles, and amphibians. He's been volunteering for Gwent Wildlife Trust for some time and currently leads their Stand for Nature Wales Youth Forum support from the Gwent Wildlife Trust staff. Good evening Michael, how are you doing? Evening James, thank you for having me and my introduction. Can I say it better myself if I tried? Yeah, um, that's good. So yeah, so I'm a primarily a volunteer with the Gwent Wildlife Trust um, and I actually started with the Trust when I was 11, um, all those years ago, um, where I started off as part of the youth group and a volunteer young and now I'm actually helping run where we're encouraging young people in the community to get involved, make a stand for nature and help fight climate change through a natural solution. Um, it's not just that that I end, I'm also a part-time ecologist um, where I primarily work with bats, amphibians, great crested newts and reptiles. Um, and I do a lot of work for the Trust. I'm also a volunteer warden for two reserves, um, Silent Valley and Dixton Embankment, um, where I do a whole host of surveys, ranging from plant phase one all the way up to birds, reptiles, mammals, you name it. I probably give, I'll give, I'll give myself a go. For me, trying to get into conservation, I don't work. In conservation, I work for a bank. Uh, actually, you don't need to be employed in conservation to make a difference and to actually have a reward in time helping. Um, I 
never have and I love my volunteering it's my one day you know I get to get the office I get to get the benefits of being outside my own mental health Um, I get to engage with young people and make a real difference in their lives um, and help encourage them particularly locally they don't know that these roles exist that they could get involved Um, and I can still remember one of my best experiences was I was doing I was taking a group of school children around a nature reserve and we found a newt and the this one little girl bless her was absolutely terrified and by the end she, she was fascinated she could not and seeing that change in someone that could potentially lead to a lifelong career um, and an interest in the natural world. For me, that's enough. Um, and I just think, sorry, I'm losing my own voice now. Um, part of it is also being a, con- as part of my classist, it's, liaison people is having those communication skills to engage people from all different backgrounds lifestyles and getting them involved actually helping them understand wow this is you can find these in your garden um, and what can you then do to help and improve it and through that and showing that knowledge and that passion will get you where, where you need to be yeah i think yeah i think that's right i think you know we're getting that theme aren't we of of you know showing your passion and then letting that come through and sort of following your heart and i think that's that's really important stuff so i mean i think it's really you know it's really interesting i think it's it adds a nice mix to tonight that you know you also so work in a bank you know we're having a discussion today that really you know to to get to a sustainable point in future all jobs need to be green jobs you know, know everything yeah. needs to be linked back to sustainability and it and you know our impact on nature and i i think that's going to be a really really big strand of of work for for this sector in the years to come so michael i mean you know when you when you're in your day job at, at the bank you know do you ever find that your values um conflict with that of of the workplace and you know do you do you sort of have you tried to make any changes to the way that your your bank works, either at you know that local or that bigger level? Absolutely, um, and it's surprising how often it happens. Um, and I'm fairly certain sometimes the um, facility manager sees my name come up in his emails, and he probably dreads <laughs> seeing them. Um, but no, th- we had a case where in the local car park. They end up having to remove some ash trees due to, um, and as soon as they, they came down, it was straight on to the mailings, making sure we had new trees planted. We've also looked now to create a wildflower meadow um, to help with pollinators in the local area, and even like just changing the culture. Of this so we've got recycling bins now, whereas instead it was just a, a normal waste tip, making sure the canteen doesn't off doesn't offer plastic straws we're now on paper straws and making sure that's to say instead of using plastic and paper cups and just helping reduce what we do um, and also helping then change that culture to help encourage people locally um, so we've been you know we've been getting out making sure people like getting colleagues to do litter picks in the local area things like, and just take pride in a where we work and for the environment at the same time without that there's no us and a constant battle between you know where's the profits and what's the right thing to do there with it yeah okay thanks thanks mark and and, you know really heartening to hear that you've been able to make those changes you know and long may your line manager tread seeing your (laughs) name in their inbox i think you know we need more people like you and 
you know maybe in time you'll get to a position where you can mentor others and and you know go into businesses and help them affect change too i think it's great yeah before we go off can i ask you a quick question james yeah go on then so with the radnishire wildlife trust how many people under 30 work for the trust at the moment um 30 percent of the staff so we've got 17 in the team are under 30. Wow. um and, you know we're being a small team it means that everybody has a very visible role to play and i'm i'm really pleased with the balance of the team at the moment but we're on the lookout for new trustees at the moment and we're keen to find some some younger candidates and we're also making plans through this stand for nature project for a youth advisory board which will probably come about a year down the line so i read this week that only three percent of trustees across the whole charity sector are under 30. you know we need to get young voices wow. in and helping with their governance helping shape their policy and their direction that's really really important to me um, and I'd urge anyone that's interested in in helping make a difference to think about volunteering their time as a, a trustee, you know, and get involved in the young trustee movement, and they can help you find a position. Because as we've heard from everyone tonight, you know, volunteering your time and upskilling yourself is very rewarding, and you know, diversifies your skill set and makes you more more employable. Um, yeah. And, and then, you know, for me, having a young team is great because there was a point in, in my life when I needed to break through and people believed in me and gave me that chance. And, and now hopefully it's my turn to do the same with others. It's very satisfying. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think we're going to go to a short video now and then we're all going to get back together for a panel discussion. Nature has been there for us when we needed it the most. Yet we have allowed our natural world and climate to reach breaking point, with almost half of our UK wildlife in decline and some of our best loved species at risk of extinction. As the climate emergency intensifies, the threat to life on Earth becomes ever greater. But we have the choice of a better and wilder future. A future where wildlife thrives alongside people. A future where nature helps us in the fight against climate change. We know that we need to stop burning fossil fuels, but we must also recognise the role of nature in helping us turn the tide. We must bring wildlife and wild places back on an ambitious scale, in turn creating new livelihoods and protecting the planet for future generations. Our lives depend on it. Nature has extraordinary powers to lock up carbon dioxide, to provide clean air and water, to help protect us from flooding and extreme weather, and to provide the food which sustains us. For decades, the wildlife trusts have been leading the way to put nature into recovery, bringing back precious salt marsh and peatlands and reintroducing beavers, our natural water engineers. But we can't do it alone. We need bold action, supporting local communities and landowners to create thriving and connected wild places on land and at sea. It's not too late to win the fight against the climate and nature crises. Given the chance, nature can recover in the most remarkable ways but we need to act quickly. The time is now to create a wilder future. That's a great video, isn't it? really powerful stuff so i think now we're, we're all going to get together for a panel discussion so hello everyone um right so i think we've got about 17 minutes for this bit so i might have to um chip in and, and prompt people to keep us moving and, and stick to time so right my first question let's go for maddie 
Um, so Maddie, has anyone acted as a mentor for you and guided you on your journey? Oh, I really love this question, actually. Um, that's great. Thank you. Uh, throughout my career, I guess, um, even now as well, I've met some amazing people, amazing professionals and and had such a variety of connections and mentors. And I mentioned in my talk when I was working over in Baja, California, that I built up a really good network of connections, which allowed me to to go back and uh, work with them again. And I sort of continue to do that as I navigated my way throughout my career. So that support network is really, really helpful. And it helped me land up land opportunities and sort of guided me along the way. But I guess my mentor throughout my career was my master's supervisor. Um, and she sort of was a huge personal and professional mentor for me. So as well as being my supervisor and a mentor, she was a fantastic scholar. She is um, and a wonderful person and another um, woman in science as well. So she was um, an amazing and very powerful figure for me within my journey. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That's good stuff. All right. So um, question for Dawood next. So Dawood, if you could change one thing about the way that we as a society impact nature, what would it be? Oh, this is a hard one, but it's 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 a very I think important question to answer. Um, I'd say we should, and I touched on this before um, a bit, but I think we should change how we educate people about the natural world. And I know doing you know so many places are doing a fantastic job. So many organisations are doing you know such a good job getting people involved, getting people into nature. But I think inherently there has been this. Um, this idea in the UK especially that wildlife conservation and nature is this sort of this luxury, this thing that we can, you know, we can only have if we have a car or, or you know, if we can only have if we can have enough free time from our jobs to do it or that sort of thing. Or, you know, it's it's something that's been commodified and then sold back to us our daily lives. You know, it's here, it's all around us, it's everywhere. Um, I And I know this person growing up in an area that isn't stereotypically thought of as a natural area. It is there all the time and nature is around us all the time, 24-7. So the I think the idea that, you know, it should be sold back to us and should be a luxury is ridiculous. I think, you know, we need to be educated about the fact that it is around us all the time. Yeah, I think, yeah. Definitely, that's powerful stuff, and I can see you've got a real passion for that, and I'm sure that you'll go out and, you know, help change people's minds and change the system. That's cool. Does anybody else want to want to come in on that at all? I think that's you nailed okay. that, that Yeah, <laughs> really yeah. eloquent answer, I think. Yeah, yeah, all right then. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, like Dawood said, it is a, it's a tough question. So... I think let's take a, a question from um, YouTube and we've got a question here that's actually from um, Ivan, who's a, a Bradnish Wildlife Trust Youth Forum member. And they've asked, you know, do you feel like you are making a difference within your current roles? Does Michael want to go first? I, yeah, absolutely. I think for every single person that we can interact with and if they can just take away one thing from that conversation we've already sparked an interest and we don't that interest could go such a long way in changing people's perceptions and their minds of the natural world um i mean look at that one like the guy who had the one idea about sea spiracy and the changes that caused with plastics and the ocean and things. I think just by having that one idea and sharing it with someone can go a very far way. Yeah, 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 good. Yeah, okay, well, that's good. That's good to know. Um, so I think, yeah, question for Ben next. So Ben, do you think that young people can make a significant difference? That's a great question. I think, um, yeah, well, I mean, let's take let's take the last couple of years for an example. Then, I mean, you know, two thousand and nineteen um, was the end of two thousand and eighteen, beginning of the youth strikes. You know, with Greta Thunberg in Sweden beginning that, and then the movement that ensued following that weekly stand. Um, you know, against 
um, you know, sort of like the climate crisis and people suddenly coming together. And I think, you know, the, the you know, the events that ensued after that have just shown that young people coming together in solidarity all across the world um, to show sort of shared um, outrage, but also support to each other in this really difficult time, you know, with the realization of the, you know, the effects of climate change that are already wreaking havoc on you know, places in the global south and all, all around the world on the natural ecosystems. Um, you know, to see the movement that's ensued with the youth movement with that um, has shown, you know, that, um, you know, young people coming together wherever you are, you know, with whatever you can um, is definitely changing. I think the really exciting thing is, 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 you know, changing the sort of political spectrum on that side of the, as well, but also obviously raising awareness because, you know, each of these kids um, you know, are striking, they're going back to their parents and they're like, you know, it's, it's raising awareness on so many different levels. And I think that's something that's really exciting to see. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that is just so incredible that we've seen over these last couple of years. Um, and that's, you know, that's just one example, but, um, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, um, thinking, just playing back some of the conversations we've had and just looking at some of the questions that have come in, there's a, there's a good one here from Leanne, um, who's posted on the YouTube chat box and she said, you know, so I guess looking for more specifics, you know, how did you guys find your current jobs? You know, did you just apply for them, you know, as adverts or were you tapped up by your network? That sort of thing. Um, is anybody really keen to answer that? Just stick your hand up if so. If not, I'll spin the wheel of fortune. <laughs> Maddie, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say spin it, but then I was going to answer it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I tried not to talk a lot about sort of how I came into this role and, and um, the sort of training I did to get to where I am today. And I tried to focus it on a, a lot of what everyone has touched upon here is, is sort of developing your passions and your interests. But to find the specific job that I was in, um, I had already volunteered um, with the local wildlife trust, so the Wildlife Trust of South West Wales, and I built that network of support as well, which was really great. And um, I applied to the comms job because that was something that I was really interested in and it was something I was developing throughout my career anyway. So um, volunteering was a big part of my career growth. Um, and something like Ben said, I actually still do now. Um, it's something I haven't lost touch with. So volunteering to do that and, and then and getting into this role as well. Cool, yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and anybody else want to share their experiences on that? That one? Um. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, I was scratching my head, but I'll, I'll answer. Anyway. <laughs> That's it. That's all I need. I'm going with that. <laughs> I fell into your trap. Um, <laughs> I'd say, um, so with me, I guess, um, so my main job at the moment, um, the one I'm, well, I'm paid for, um, is, um, well, I'm paid for the others as well. I don't want to say anything about, um, about the other ones, but uh, the one that I, I guess is the, uh, the most permanent of them is the... Um, being a television a wildlife researcher at BBC Natural History Unit. And I guess the way the way I got into that um, was through multiple, you know, applications, through websites um, and interviews at the BBC. Um, but really the experience that I have um, in writing and in storytelling and the stuff that I did alongside my degree at university, um, which was in marine biology, but, um, you know, that helped because it's the science degree, I guess. But, you know, a lot of the people who I meet in the BBC and a lot of people who work in wildlife film and in natural history um, storytelling, whether that be in writing or in film, they don't necessarily have, you know, degrees in science. They, did, they didn't necessarily start in that. They just show a passion for nature and wildlife. And the experience they get in writing is because they enjoy writing and they love it. And, you know, that's what I did. I loved writing, so I thought... I want to do it so i'm going to apply to write for magazines i'm going to apply to write for blogs and in the beginning it was voluntary and it was writing for free and you know in as you go on you gain more experience and then you start to write for for you know for pay and you start to go on to bigger and better things but the the you know the truth of the matter is if you have an interest and love in something enough to pursue it you can basically you know you can get jobs where you thought you would never get them it's just about um, I think people understanding that they 
they can do that because a lot of the time what we think we can't do is the thing that holds us back i think mm -hmm. cool good stuff good stuff and um michael do you want to share anything um on that side of things i mean how did you get into your consultancy work so yeah so part of it for me was a bit of luck um i was actually doing a survey on one of the reserves i managed for the local trust and I bet I bumped into this lady, bless her, and there I was lifting up reptile sheets, one hand, sweet nets, and another sort of thing, doing just a bit of everything. Um, and she sort of asked me, "What you doing?" Um, and we had a chat. I told her, um, and then she was saying, "I oh, I got a, I run my own consultancy. I'm looking for surveyors. Um, what's your number? Would you be prepared to come and do a couple bat surveys for me?" Um, and it's gone from there. And I think just putting yourselves out there, not being afraid to talk to people can go a long way mm. in making that first step of finding someone who can, you know, help point you in that direction. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, yeah that's, uh, yeah, interesting. And I think, you know, a lot of people I know have, have got into the sector that way because life is about who you know but you know people by getting out there and, and making contacts don't you and putting yourself around and showing that you've got passion and you're you're trying to build skills and you know that you're coming at this from a from a good place all right so looking at the time there's uh, i think time for one last question and it's one i really want to ask you guys because you know you're the future you're the future of conservation so no pressure but um you know, sometimes you know conservationists don't always sort of make a good enough fist of saying what we want you know mm. what we think is good you know we are you know can be quite good at well, we're pretty damn good at saying what we don't like but you know we need to perhaps paint that picture of the future a bit more so what does a nature rich future look like for you and by 2050 what will wales look like and what changes did we make to get there i think, I think I know that's a big question. This ben, do you want to come in first? Yeah, sure. Um, well, just briefly on the sort of backstory to that, I think this is so important in our current situation and it, it, it plays into what Dawood has been saying a lot as well as the power of storytelling. And I think we really need to tell new stories right now because the stories that you see um all around right now are one of you know the sort of destruction that's happening the doom and the gloom and you know what's that for mo you know motivating your average person who has maybe only heard about climate change and nature a little bit you know that isn't much of a motivation you know it just sort of shuts people down all these facts and figures and everything it really doesn't engage people emotionally but the stories that we need to tell okay what is the future where we've come together and we've actually, you know, sorted ourselves out and started to fix, you know, restore the environment and things. For here in Wales, what I would love to see is the the return to sort of like more localization. So sort of like localized supply chains of goods. We've got an amazing environment here in Wales where, you know, the food that we grow, the products that we make, we, you know, we've got forests and things, which yes, we need to restore these for nature as well, but we also need to stop, you know, sort of like globalization of of our supply chains you know we can sort of like work in communities um and look at where we source um you know our food and things we have those those expertise of working the land here in wales and i think the coming together of that sort of land management and restoration is really exciting you know i would love to hear and see lapwings and curlews in the spring all across restored uplands in wales where we've blocked up the you know the sort of peat and re-wetted re parts of our uplands as forests starting to come up in places that they haven't been for many, many years. We've got beavers on a lot of rivers that are doing their job and the invertebrate, invertebrate populations are expanding. You've got hay, the return of hay meadows, wildflower meadows, and that soundscape returning to parts of Wales that maybe hasn't been there for a long time under the sort of degraded, you know, really hammered intensive grasslands that you have. And that, you know, all these different things, I think, trying to engage people in these conversations and what we want to see and, and 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 try and feel it is so important moving forward so when you engage people in the actual practical you know what that involves in terms of the changes to our behaviors and lifestyles that's brilliant i'm really glad i asked that question um but that does bring us to time i'm afraid so it's just down to me now to say thanks to everybody for um joining us tonight um and thanks to the people behind the scenes that have helped make this happen. You know, 
What an inspiring group of people we've had here tonight. You know, I feel really good knowing that there are people like Michael, Doward and Maddie and Ben out there trying to make a difference. Because as I've said, young conservationists are the future. The next generation will still be working in 2050 and they'll see the results of the decisions that we make today for climate and nature. So you'll inherit our present. And to get a better deal for nature, our sector needs succession. The future wildlife trusts will need people to fix the things our current generation couldn't or didn't. And you'll need to build on the successes we've made. So if you're out there watching tonight, just remember this. You could be the next Chris Packham or Conservation's Emily Pankhurst or any one of the hard-working individuals that are dedicated but are rarely in the public eye who strive to make Wales a better place for wildlife and their climate. So contact your local wildlife trust volunteer, sign up to training, offer your skills, join a youth group, ideally through Stand for Nature, or step forward and become a trustee, or even create your own group online or in person. Movements need leaders, activists and agents of change, and you can all do and be that at home, at work and online every day. You've been inspired by nature and the people we've heard from tonight. Follow your heart. Do it with passion, energy. Don't be deterred, keep learning. If you want to be a leader of any sort, remember, creating the conditions for change means you will figuratively speaking have to stick your head above the crowd. Some people are going to cheer you on when you do that, but some will want to take shots at you. When that happens, just smile and keep going. It means you're challenging the status quo and you are not alone. More and more people want a better future for the planet. So speak truth to power and show people that there is a better way for nature. We all need nature and nature needs you. Thank you. Diok, Ahil. Awesome. Thank